Well, you mentioned the Merkaba, and I know that the, you know, for a lot of public scientists, I mean, they regard the Merkaba as kind of like a lot of mumbo jumbo. I mean, I know that there was uh, Drunvalo Melchizedek came out, I think it was in the 1980s, with this two, two volume a set of books called The Flower of Life, and uh, people started to do the the workshops associated with that, trying to generate their Merkaba using consciousness. And uh, certainly that seems to be something that people believe can be done through consciousness alone. But what you've described seems to be a very interesting mix of consciousness and kind of like reinterpreting old physics. So yeah, maybe just kind of like elaborate a little bit on, sure. on the Merkaba and how it relates to all of this. Sure, I appreciate that, Doctor. I think ultimately, to be clear as well, what I'm doing and what others around the world are doing, um, I think is nothing new per se. I think we are a species rediscovering the same set of uh, quote unquote tricks, if you will, over and over again, uh, which is why I say that what I'm working on is nothing to do with combining any type of AI or anything like this. It is purely organic with the planet in combination with alchemical processes um, and the human DNA and all of this. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dave Rossi, who is the known as the podcaster Generation Z. And he's been covering some really exotic issues and has had some profound changes in his own personal life because of his interest in this area. So welcome, Dave, to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Doctor. I really appreciate it. It's truly an honor to be here, and um, I couldn't be more delighted to be with you and your audience today. Okay, so let's begin with your podcast, uh, Generation Z. You've had that for uh, several years now. So well, why did you get interested in these alternative topics, uh, new age or, or, or new, new physics and science principles? So how did all that begin for you? Sure. So basically, like many others, when, when COVID had begun in the um, early months of 2020, what essentially happened was I was, uh, prior to that, I was in the construction uh, the industry or business, if you will. And I, I had, like many others, you know, two or three months off when no one knew what was really going on with, with COVID and all of this. And so what I tried to do at the time, um, as I said in, in previous interviews as well, is I simply said to myself, I want to do something in the media world-ish and perhaps starting a podcast would be, you know, it was something that was still 2019, 2020. It was sort of, at, in my opinion, the podcasting uh, business was at sort of the peak or the tipping point of so many people creating podcasts. So I did not expect it to go anywhere. Uh, what ended up happening was essentially I made a podcast that was essentially trying to emulate, for lack of a better term, uh, Joe Rogan in the sense of just discussing everything and anything. But then what happened was about a, maybe a month into doing this podcast, no video, just audio. If I got maybe 10 listens or views on, a, on, a, on a, an episode, you know, eight out of the 10 being my mother or somebody in my family, I would be very happy. But what ended up happening was I did an episode on Project Bluebeam. And out of nowhere, it got, I, I had no social media followers, nothing. Out of nowhere, it got about 4,500, 5,000 uh, views or listens. And then I said, okay, there's something here. And then I did another one on Operation Paperclip, and it got about 1,500, 2,000 views or listens. And what I did was, uh, doctor, I took about a week or two to not record anything else. But what I did was I looked um, at all, as, as much as I could at the palette of uh, all across social media and, and the web and all of that, whether it was videos, whether it was um, articles or communities, you name it, of people in the, you know, UFO, UAP realm, because it seemed like there was um, a hunger from individuals in that world, even in, you know, a high strangeness, paranormal. But one thing seemed to be missing. Now, as, as a, the time we're recording this, things have certainly changed, I'm sure. But at the time, I didn't, to my knowledge, see a show 
um, if you will, on a very low grounded level that essentially covered an aspect of just exploring multiple ideas of the paranormal and merging it in with things like, you know, UAPs, UFOs, uh, Bigfoot, all of this. And in addition to even a more of a grand macro scale, uh, scale geopolitical uh, sort of, you know, galactic cosmological affair situation. And so I started to explore those routes without saying to anybody, I am right, you are wrong, vice versa. What I said was, let's explore this together. And so the show kind of, uh, you know, snowballed from there in a good way. And essentially, um, of course, we have for our members uh, where we do group calls, weekly calls, uh, even more than once a week, where we do exactly that. We simply have sort of a miniature think tank session and all of that. And we just discuss the different uh, possibilities and I don't claim to be right nor wrong whatsoever. And so that's that's how it started um, leading up until the events of this previous year. So did you ever have any kind of experiences with uh, UFOs uh, prior to this year? Did you ever see a UFO or a UAP as it's now called? Um, truthfully, I, I think I have, but it wasn't of any significance. However, um, in real time, you're, you're making me think in a good way, doctor, of some people in my family, my family lineage, uh, my main b- background primarily is um, of Italian ethnicity, and my family comes from Italy and all of this. And there were certainly, whether it was my uh, grandfather or his father, um, there were certainly very interesting, we could call um, esoteric or high strangeness occurrences that happened to them. Um, Um, It seemed that uh, over the period of time, there was something with myself, amongst many others too, as I'm sure you're familiar with, and this understanding of intuition, being able to feel certain things, not always being correct, to be fair, but there was certainly something in, in the family lineage, but as for, did I see a craft before that? I think so, but nothing up close, nothing of, you know, uh, extreme significance. Okay, so everything changed for you in the summer of this year. So what what happened? Sure. So what essentially happened was about this time last year of uh, 2020, uh, 2021 going into 2022, using the show as sort of what I would call an autodidactic platform. So uh, using the show by uh, teaching through learning and learning through teaching in correspondence with the audience and everyone. I said to myself about a year ago, privately, I said, why don't I try and basically build this this type of you know anti gravity device or the things that so many people speak on? And so I started to you know look into scientific uh, you know terminologies and things. And now this takes us into the new year, and I'm continuing to pursue this for for weeks and weeks and months. And and this then takes us into probably about I would say May May June time. And what ended up happening was to be clear, I can't. Um, tell even to this day if the experience was um, physical, if you will, material, or if it was something more astral or, you know, more lighter in density. And so, or, you know, some type of dream state, I was essentially, I will use the word abducted, but it was not of any malevolent feeling in any regard or way. And I was basically taken onto what seemed to be a very fluid, a beautiful craft really from what I can remember in a visual sense, but there was not much I could specifically recall as I was sort of phasing in and out of what we'd call consciousness, I guess. And what I could make out was there was this blue being significantly taller than the average human um, more than likely. And it was doing something to the, the, from what I recall the right side of my brain. And I don't particularly remember what it was doing. It did not feel invasive. It did not feel threatening. It did not feel anything like this. And next thing I knew, my essentially, I closed my eyes and that was it. The next morning, doctor, I woke up and essentially I had a uh, something in my brain, sort of, it felt like a switch turned on in the sense that I believe that everyone has this type of uh, capability or possibility. But what happened was that I took a liking for the sciences, particle physics, uh, chemistry, uh, electrical, ceramic engineering, um, uh, optics, you name it. I took a liking for these subjects in which I essentially failed. I was, uh, my teachers were grateful enough in high school to pass me in all of those subjects, barely with a 50%. Um, And all of a sudden I was able to understand the equations in very, you know, highly sophisticated academic papers. I was able to interpret the equations in various ways. I I began to even, um, I will go as far as to say, 
which I haven't said on any other show, see or feel. I like to use the word feel more than see, but these equations as blue visuals, if you will, in, in, in my head. Um, some things are more easier to feel than others, but um, I would liken this type of correlation or example to the film Tenet when there was a scene in the beginning when they were trying to understand, um, are you catching the bullet or throwing it in terms of the way time works? And one professor says, do not try and understand it because you never will, but instead feel it. And so that's what I would liken my experience to when um, ever since I had, I guess, woken up that day, uh, uh, that morning up until this day. Okay, so the experience had some kind of impact in activating that portion of your brain that could, I guess, conceptualize. Well, if it's the right brain, we're talking about picture, right? To, to be able to picture, uh, I guess what you were talking about equations so that you could clearly see equations. Equations. Previously, you had um, no real talent for that. No, absolutely not. Uh, equations, even uh, I guess we could call um, or we could say what's called pattern analysis, um, pattern recognition, um, able to sort of a combination of using the brain, but also, again, for lack of a better description, intuition to essentially guide me as I'm going through a, a paper or an equation. And then essentially uh, my intuition or this inner voice will say, well, focus on this instead of that or something like this. And just by trusting my intuition, it would end up having very beautiful results when it came time to engineering what I was trying to do and successfully did. So, so that's very interesting. So you're you're getting these clear images of equations. There's pattern recognition going on, and and you start to invent things or you start to build what it is that you're envisaging. What's what's coming into you now? Now, in terms of the, the origin of these things, do you, do you think it was just the downloads that you, you got from the this blue being, or do you think it was that it was somehow stimulating an ability within you to come up with these ideas yourself? That I appreciate the question, Doctor. I, I, I would actually say a good a good balance of both, to tell you the truth, because it's one thing for uh, myself to wake up and have um, intuitive, quote unquote, downloads, if you will. But if I don't do anything with those downloads, that's only half the battle right there. If I don't apply it, if I don't apply it, whether to um, my papers or whether to, uh, you know, in the laboratory, when I go to the lab and things like this, it, it it's just kind of like, you know, sitting on gold in the treasure box, but you never take it out of the box. Okay, so you're, you're getting these downloads and uh, you're interested now in engineering things. Now, I mean, you're a builder by trade, so you, you didn't have a laboratory to start with. So how did you build these things? So basically, uh, to, to give a clear description to, your, to yourself and to your audience, essentially, I had realized on a theoretical level, um, not the, because I'm not saying I discovered all of the ways, but a set of ways or missing keys, if you will, in the equations that I was then able to translate into practical application with a couple thousand dollars saved up um, out here in Canada. And essentially what I decided to do was what I initially tried to set out to do this time last year, even before the, I guess we could say the alleged, uh, uh, the abduction or experience, which was simply build what we would call an anti-gravity uh, device of sorts, just to even proof of concept, even if it was something like getting this water bottle to levitate and then go flying or propagate, as they say. So essentially, I had a, you know, the, the place where I was, there was a lot of land, thankfully. And basically taking this, as Dr. Sal Paez says, this new perspective on old physics, I was able to apply a, a plethora of about seven different ways of developing what we would call um, anti-gravity, what Dr. Salvatore Paez calls the super force, what we could call zero point energy. And so what happened was I was completely careless, uh, again, no laboratory. When I turned what I call this generator on, I've since made a few variations, but the first one um, basically set off a sort of ground wave EMP in which was detectable, but it didn't help that there was a military base you know, shortly from uh, where I was at the point at that time, but it basically set off a ground wave EMP that exists, um, I, I guess we could say, outside of what would be called the, the typical thermal and electromagnetic spectrum that we're used to measuring and that our devices are used to measuring, but it certainly was picked up on devices that 
we could say uh, certain groups within the government have or the military. And that basically set off a, a quote unquote alarm. And I had not known this at the time. And so I had basically had gotten, uh, you know, little marble balls to levitate and go flying. I had introduced old microwaves in this device. Um, and the device, some of the materials I could say that it was made up of were in fact uh, tungsten, copper, uh, wood, um, using various forms of, I guess, what we would call uh, kinetic energy or electricity, things that are, in my humble opinion, uh, right under our noses, being hidden in plain sight, as they say. And um, also, uh, to be fair, questioning a little bit of the status quo within the field of electrical engineering and particle physics. So basically, I was able to do quite quite a bit. And this was all prior to um, being uh, getting a knock on the door, whether literally or in other ways as well. Okay, so because you build this device, you're able to generate an anti-gravity effect on various things nearby, just using kind of off-the-shelf materials that you purchased using your, your couple, of, couple of thousand dollars in savings. And unbeknown to you, you generated a small uh, an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse, that registered on recording devices near you. And so people in the military started to investigate. So what, what happened next? What, what, who was behind that top on the door? Sure. So basically what happened was in the process of all of this, I also tried filing a, a patent in Canada, uh, basically, which was a device that would have been able to detect the same energy that I was accessing and emitting unknowingly at the time with respects to the emission part. And basically, when I called to follow up on, on the patent number with, with Ida, the receipt and everything, um, basically, the, the patent office said, we're, it doesn't exist. We, we're not sure what you're talking about, sir. So that's when things started to get a little bit funny. Now, obviously, that's um, I, I knew ahead of time I was going to get some attention, but I sort of wanted to poke the bear a bit, if you will, and see what would happen. I then, within a week of that occurring, I then started receiving emails from uh, people out of, uh, we could say, the various departments of the Pentagon and um, other uh, other agencies as well, three-letter agencies across North America, just saying, listen, you know, we're interested in no, no, no threats whatsoever, just, you know, we're interested in, in what you're doing. We've heard about your YouTube show um, and things like this. Now, I said to myself, I'm not stupid, right? To say that they're interested in the YouTube show shortly after, when I had not received anything like this before, shortly after I turned this device on, something was going on. Um, in my opinion. And so what ended up happening was basically I started corresponding with a lot of these different officials and some of them I, I pushed away. Um, others, I, in fact, uh, I guess you could say embraced in a particular regard because some certain groups, um, I guess you could say, allowed me to present to them, whether digitally or in person, uh, present to them my findings, how I built the, the, the device, the generator, um, also my uh, perspectives on the theoretical side of things, because without rambling too much, there are many different ways that one can tap this underlying energy. I think ultimately what we're tapping is the same underlying energy, but whether it's via things like alleged cold fusion or things like um, strictly with uh, fluids and liquids or with uh, plasmas or anything like this, um, ele electricity and magnetism, I think, again, there are multiple ways to skin a cat, if you will. And so basically this energy, every time it's accessed, sends off, sets off an alarm at the, and basically um, there were, there were some cases where there were some jets flown over the, the place where I was staying because of the introduction of microwaves into my generator. Looking back, um, I, I know very clearly how I set this off. What, you know, if I could do it again, I probably wouldn't. But essentially, there came a point where I was told um, I need to be I need to be quiet about things, essentially. And the reason being is because basically this this understanding of the sciences in this regard is so under our noses um, that it's so almost I would say, in my humble opinion, Anywhere from 40 to 70 percent of people in Europe and North America have within their homes the, nece um, the necessary uh, resources, tools and devices to uh, build, uh, not perhaps anything grand, but something enough to say, look, we, we have a gravity negation or anti-gravity going. Um, 
And the reason for this is if it's so hidden is because when one accesses this anti-gravity field, you're not just tapping anti-gravity. What you're also tapping is the manipulation of time and space. You're tapping things such as telekinesis, in which I can say now um, I am, you know, behind the scenes, uh, off the record, so to speak, has been, you know, calculated, substantiated, you name it. It's now called publicly, you know, quantum physics and all of this. Um, all of this is accessible when you turn on a quote unquote anti-gravity device. Now you can, unfortunately, it can also be weaponized very easily as well. And this becomes one of the concerns that I somewhat understand, but ultimately it's right under our noses and it's a beautiful thing, doctor. And it's, it's not, in my opinion, one doesn't need to be a scientist to um, understand or grasp this actually to the contrary. That's very important what you just said, uh, that 50% or more of the material that's needed to build one of these anti-gravity devices is available in most homes. Because I remember coming across the case of Otis T. Carr uh, back in 1960-61, where he built using off-the-shelf material, just going to the local hardware store and getting whatever it was needed. He built an anti-gravity device, a ship, and actually got, uh, I think it was three pilots uh, to go in that ship, and they actually were successful. And then they, his uh, laboratory, his research facility was raided by different government agencies, and he was shut down, and he was eventually, you know, set up and all of that. So this is a very important point to emphasize that anti-gravity doesn't need a Lockheed Martin skunk work or a Boeing's Phantom Works or a, a major corporation to build these very, very billion, expensive billion-dollar anti-gravity devices. It can be done using off-the-shelf material, but those entities, government agencies, want to hide that from us. Uh, and very, there are various elements in which are very interested in hiding it. Is uh, yes, I am of the, um, the personal belief as as of this moment that there are certain elements, uh, albeit not a lot of them, but there are certain elements that are actually interested in having a lot of this stuff come out. This is one of the reasons I started my company Salt because I believe that ultimately, although this this technology and this understanding and knowledge can be weaponized, even many, various forms of uh, alchemy as well. It should not be a reason that this should be hidden from the vast majority of people, because I think it is denying something that is rightfully uh, perhaps even a topic that can unite people in a very, very benevolent manner as well. Um, if I may say as well, too, there, there are also individuals that, um, of course, I, I won't be able to go into names, but it is of my humble understanding that there are individuals that are act as, if you will, for lack of a better term, gatekeepers of the community. And what I mean by that is if you have a scientist with half decent funding in a laboratory and they're conducting certain experiments um, from via maybe via private funding or something like this, and they have some type of phenomena that occurs that negates space and time or, you know, anti-gravity, if they publish or when they publish their findings, what a lot of people will find, whether it's in the West or around the world, is that the individual conduct who conducted the experiment and wrote a beautiful paper on how they did the equations, how they you know ex engineered it, all of this, um, and repeated it multiple times, they're attacked, not the actual content of the equation or the experiment itself. Um, I would say that this is largely due to various groups um, at higher levels, particularly corporate groups, trying to keep this under wraps. In addition, um, the let's call them gatekeepers, if you will, um, some of which are, in my humble opinion, you know, spread across military intelligence, civilian intelligence, academia. There are certain individuals where or certain people that will say, oh, this equation or this, you know, experiment, it'll never work. Forget about it. Meanwhile, in their own papers, if one understood their equations, the same thing they said publicly won't work, they're saying in their papers does. So it speaks to this idea of creating some type of, um, I dare I say, gaslighting, making you know certain people who are just trying to do good question themselves over and over. Um, I don't mean to speak to any positive nor negative, uh, you know, grand malevolent intent, but I think it's pretty clear by now that by definition of wanting to control and suppress something, you're you're stopping the masses from getting it. Yeah, I, I remember uh, 
uh, hearing another inventor by the name of Ralph Ring, who was also working on some of these devices in the 1950s. And he, he said he was working for a major uh, aerospace company at the time, and they asked for some kind of solution uh, to a one of the pro uh, one of the projects that they had uh, they ran into a, a problem and he when he came up with the solution uh, they rather than being happy and promoting him they actually warned him that you know they're they're there not to solve the problems but to raise to, but to raise more questions that right. it wasn't it wasn't to solve things but it was just to come up with salute or, or come up with uh justifications for for continuing that process i i couldn't agree more and if if i may without um constantly plugging my my company and all of this the, the reason i started salt um which stands for a strategic analysis and assessment of longitudinal technologies is because there have been a lot of people that have approached me privately whether it's people in hollywood or people even other world governments that i've uh, given presentations to and have done a uh, small consulting for where they've said listen we're coming to you dave because ultimately obviously um i respect their their privacy but they feel that if they go through any quote unquote official channel in any regard, whether federally or otherwise on a corporate level, they're just going to be given the runaround. They're not going to be told what's really going on. To your point, doctor, they're just going to be given this constant, well, we don't know, maybe we're onto something well, so and so. Whereas I am not, um, I don't consider myself super intelligent, but not naive either, to the point where I don't. I understand that I cannot just blurt out what it would take, whether theoretically or in the laboratory, to tap a lot of this um, energy. But at the same time, I do feel that it is far beyond the point that the that you know world governments should know, should be informed, because in my humble opinion, in a, in a benevolent way, in sort of a, you know, cosmological galactic sense, what's coming cannot be stopped by any human, in my humble opinion. So that that's what I say. When I say what, what's coming, I, I mean, you know, this idea of, uh, for lack of a better term, this spiritual ascendance uh, perspective in a very organic angle. And if, if I may say one last thing, one of the things I try and encourage, whether with the company or with the show, is to sort of uh, do do one's best to keep away from a lot of the whole chip in the brain or, you know, uh, AI type stuff and speak more to an organic, fluid, um, intuitive angle of things in which has been accounted for privately in the science world, has been proven, tested again and again for many decades, but has been hidden because it cannot be controlled once it gets out, in, as I understand it. Yes, I think that's a very important point to make, and and we'll return to that and and to your your salt initiative. That's that's very interesting. So just going back to these different scientists that approached you after your device was tested, and you got a phone call, or you you, were, you, know, you had someone call up on you at your home. You, you're starting to make contact. Now you shared some of that correspondence with me. Now you don't want to name any of these scientists identify them in any way, but you did send me some on a confidential basis. And I looked at those and I can confirm that, yes, these are uh, some pretty major scientists that were in, were corresponding with Dave and they were very interested in his uh, information, his knowledge. And so that's something that I was uh, impressed by because I know these are people that are very, very busy and they would only be communicating with you if you were the real deal. And I think this is one of the things about this whole field of UFOs and extraterrestrial contact, even though on the one hand, uh, the government agencies and scientists will kind of poo-poo the whole thing and ridicule it. On the other hand, they are very, very interested in anyone who has knowledge of these kind of devices, technologies, especially someone, and it seems that this is what maybe makes you unique, Dave, is that you can render these inventions in mathematical equations. To, to a very large degree, yes, um, in various forms as well, whether in chemistry or optics or um, uh, uh, particle physics, you know, quantum field theory, quantum chromodynamics, 
uh, loop gravity. Um, and the reason I say this is not in a boasting manner. I say this because I would like to encourage uh, uh, yourself and your audience, doctor, that it doesn't necessarily take a sort of quote unquote, super smart person to understand this. Um, it is simply a, a new perspective on old physics going back to um, two, 300 years ago. And I'm just speaking in terms of modern history. That's not to be said for, you know, all the ancient civilizations then. And what I can tell you in your audience is that maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think in ancient Sumer or our, in ancient Egypt, um, our ancestors were running, you know, uh, uh, Riemannian uh, Ritchie tensor manifolds and all these type of, you know, metric systems and functions. They had a different perspective on how they could apply this, both in their scriptures and when actually using such uh, materials. So, um, what I'm trying to say essentially is I think ultimately big picture, it is the encompassing of multiple areas of academia. So if you were just a chemist and I was just a, you know, a physicist, our egos would get in the way so rapidly of, well, you know, you're a chemist, stay in your lane. And then you say to me, Dave, you're a physicist, stay in your lane. Well, the, the, the butchering of that, I would dare to say, has been to a very large degree quite deliberate. And then you have your odd ones out, the scientists that end up have getting, uh, you know, doing very well. They notice certain things that they simply can't put away, uh, very similar to some of the presentations I've given to those at the DOD where I've said, listen, let's, let's cut the BS here. Don't tell me this stuff doesn't work. Because, you know, I've ran the numbers and especially with what was built, let, let's be real here. So ultimately, I think what we're seeing is a, a big, big, um, a, a hopefully a push in a benevolent manner to bring a lot of this out in, in that way. That's a really interesting point, uh, because I know that science has become so compartmentalized and specialized and you, you, you'll have an engineer kind of like not familiar with uh, chemistry and, and chemists will, won't be very familiar with mathematics. And, and so you have this kind of like compartmentalization where people specialize. And while they may understand that, that particular area very, very well, they're very ignorant of others. Whereas the approach you're taking is much more holistic and integrating it all. So how important is that overall to, to have this kind of holistic approach to science? Well, I appreciate the question so much because I think it's very vital. It speaks to this idea that whether what I'm doing, uh, you know, uh, white papers and reports for different uh, private groups and, and certain world governments, or whether it's what I do on uh, our Patreon uh, on the show, um, essentially is with our members, we, we try and take what we call disagreements and integrate them, not to check off people's confirmation bias box, but to try and integrate them in a manner where, well, if we look at the dual slit experiment in quantum physics, reality is only as real as the individual observing such. So if you and I, doctor, go for a ride in, the, in, in, in your car and we, we go for a coffee and on our way, we see a craft in the sky and you see a triangular craft and I see a spherical one, it's in the same co geographical coordinates, but we're seeing different shapes. You are not wrong. I am not right nor wrong either. It is simply how we are perceiving what we would call information structures. And I think that that has been in a, I will say in a conspiratorial manner, uh, used as an emotional force to get academics to constantly clash and then never end up speaking again. And then, you know, for decades, they, they're just insulting each other instead of working together. I, I think this is something that can be rectified quite easily. And I think that um, although you'll never be able to get everybody to agree on something, I think disagreements are very healthy as long as there's no um, emotional rhetoric involved. For example, I'll end this off by saying, even on my show, when I um, interview people, um, <clears throat> I, I also ask certain people who have strong disagreements um, in various areas. I say, why do you disagree with so-and-so? And I always preface it with, I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm genuinely curious because you may know something that I don't. So that's, and I think that we can apply that to the whole academic community. The, the more I learn, whether theoretically or in the laboratory doctor, the more I realize I don't know anything. And I think in a philosophical sense, that speaks to the joys in the journey, because once you discover something, you want to know what's next after that in, in, a, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, of course, we have the, the, the philosophical uh, aspect of this kind of new science where 
people can have different opinions and uh, they can all be partially right. But when it comes to building a device that is going to generate an anti-gravity effect or, or create kind of uh, an abundance of uh, electrical energy like a fusion generator, I mean, those principles that are used for building that, that, that is something that people can replicate. It's not, not yeah. So, you know, at some point there's kind of like this balance between um, kind of like having this openness to new ideas, different perspectives, but at the end of the day, you know, a, a, an anti-gravity device either works or it doesn't. Um, a nuclear fusion device either works or it doesn't. So right. how, how does that apply? Sure. Well, when one applies the methodologies, whether alchemically, scientifically, or in a nuts and bolts sense, um, to tap this underlying energy, um, within the context of this reality, there are certain things that we must adhere to in terms of when we talk about facts relative to when you're building something in the lab, you can't just, to your point, you can't just make a, an adjustment because you want it to be and then that's simply it. Um, that's sort of, um, I think that would be possible in a, in a much different context or sense with respects to more humans doing that. Uh, in, but with respects to building a craft and then matching the precise geometrical specificity that are needed. Once you tap that underlying energy, you can sort of like how, putting your hand under the very bottom layer of your bed sheet and moving your hand all under the bed, basically, and then choosing where you want to poke your hand out of and run it through the blankets, sort of like poking a pencil through, the, through it. That would be the same idea as once one can tap this underlying energy, you, whether locally around you, near you, or at a whole other vast distance away, you can essentially affect or effectuate the, I mean, you name it, the, the density of an object, the shadow of it, the mass of it, the size of it. Um, you can even open portals as, as you know, quote unquote, uh, woo, as that may sound, um, in which has all been substantiated. But you can, for example, take this, this water bottle and have it for example, turn into a banana, let's say. And the reason for that is because people will say programmable matter. Well, that's a little bit different. What we're discussing here is the organic underlying energy or blueprint of this reality. And that's what tapping this, um, this energy can and does do, if, if hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Well, I, I wanted to raise um, a question related to you, you, a couple of times you've mentioned alchemy and what that brought to mind to me was a series of books by a Romanian author by the name of Radu Cinema and he's written a number a seven volume series of books and one of them is called Forgotten Genesis I think it's book six in the series and in there he's talking about the DNA experiments that created humanity and very similar to the kind of Sumerian records about the Anunnaki creating uh, humans, very similar to that, but pointing out how alchemy and astrology were vital parts of this genetic modification and creation of humanity. And that's kind of, that's very well alchemy i can understand but uh, astrology so can you speak to that how do these kind of like esoteric disciplines alchemy and astrology relate to new science and genetic experimentation sure i appreciate that very much that question well i would say whether it's our dna strands whether it is um of which i think by the way there's more than two i think what they call junk dna is not junk whatsoever um i i I don't think it, I, I know it not to sound overly confident or conceited, but the same quote unquote spiraling or turning motion in which of course quantum physics covers completely. It's all about loops and rings and things like this. The same spiraling motion that our DNA, um, our DNA strands currently, uh, you know, reside within in that state is the same spiraling motion used when craft take off. It is the same motion used when there is a quote unquote unexplained phenomena in a high strangeness sense. In other words, we're dealing with spirals and rings uh, instead of straight lines. Now, if we were to apply that on a grand scale, uh, doctor, and we look, for example, at things like the, um, the golden spiral, the Fibonacci sequence, we will find this to be the case in the galaxies that in the galaxy we reside in and in other galaxies as well too um based off of the data now 
ultimately, the way that there's a direct correspondence is the operation of the galaxy and the cosmos is a larger, we could say, uh, operation or set of movements and transitions as what occurs here. And so by combining the concept of conducting a particular alchemical ritual at a particular day and time or location relative to a certain alignment of the stars or of some type of planetary body or some, some energetic frequency event, there is in fact amplification in that alchemical process on the surface, if you're doing it say on the surface of the earth, um, if you're close to a body of water, if you're closer more to sand, this dives into you know the geometries of the alleged ley lines. All of this, I will say with confidence has, can be um, calculated, substantiated, and it is not nearly as complicated as people think. Um, I think there's just been more of a, an illusion of complication instead of basically speaking to a grand operation and a small one, similar to when people are on psychedelics. They've said, some people have said, Dave, I can zoom in and zoom out, if you will. It's the same idea. It's just happening on a grander scale, if that makes sense. So how does that relate to consciousness? I know one of the things that I've come across again and again in interviewing many contactees and people within the secret space programs is that the consciousness, the human consciousness interfaces with these advanced technologies. So when we come to the sciences of alchemy and astrology, both have a significant element of, of consciousness. So then, you know, that kind of does raise the question, well, how does consciousness be, become part of this kind of like complex question, sure. these complex questions relating alchemy, astrology, new science, energy, sure, anti gravity, and so forth. I, I appreciate that question so much because um, I think what we're looking at is a couple different things. I can tell you where even my focuses lie uh, with respects to consciousness and, and my work with what I'm doing at SALT, which is that there are a lot of people that are looking on how to, quote unquote, die properly and, and die in the sense strictly of not in a spiritual sense. There's a you know a lot of evidence to suggest, uh, particularly behind the scenes, that um, the spirit never dies, but trying to find a way out of this, quote unquote, vessel body condition container without going into some type of alleged uh, reincarnation cycle. Now, what this has to do with the DNA and all of this is that going back to what I said before about there are two strands, double helix strands, but then there's something called junk DNA. I firmly am of the uh, humble opinion, um, and I encourage you and your audience to read between the lines here, that there is a third strand to our DNA in which is um, made up of uh, copper, gold, and perhaps tungsten. That is electrically conductive, that third strand. And so what happens is within the, uh, the we could say, distance, orbit, or resonance of the planet, just being on the surface of the planet, the planet itself is living as well. It has a natural heartbeat. So the planet's heartbeat, just like how our body absorbs and then re-emits frequencies when every, as we speak right now, the planet does the same thing, except in a, on a grander scale in space. So it is absorbing certain frequencies that are perhaps being propagated or emitted from a group, uh, whether in a material sense or otherwise, or a natural resonance of the cosmos, perhaps, that is then being, if you will, um, zapped into us, for lack of a better term. Now, I appreciate your question so much, doctor, because this same methodology with the DNA and consciousness and how it works is the same underlying energy that has the missing key um, to tap anti-gravity. So there's a deep intertwinement and connection. And I think ultimately, um, in terms of uh, are we conscious? Do we have free will? It is of my understanding, based on some of the work I'm doing now as well for private individuals, um, absolutely. Uh, with that said, um, is there something perhaps that has been keeping its throat on us and also using our own prejudices as well to amplify that suppression? I Unfortunately, I would say probably. Um, but I think ultimately this has to do uh, as well with um, basically breaking the um, breaking the hydrogen bonds in our in our DNA, and that allows for an elevation of of consciousness. Now, in terms of where we are consciously, and in, in, in terms of a location, I don't think it is. I agree with Sir Roger Penrose when he says it is not local. Um, I agree with Roger Penrose when he says that 
I can't say what consciousness is so much as what and where it isn't. And I don't think it's in this material reality. But I think that DNA strand, I think there's a connection there. So this third strand of DNA, which is misidentified as junk DNA, I mean, that's that's there right now, you're, you're saying, and, and it's operating, but scientists don't understand it. So um, I, I know there's a lot of people that also talk about 12 strands of DNA. So do you know anything about that? I mean, how many strands of DNA do we have? Sure. So without getting too um, uh, nerdy or, or quirky here, um, as I understand it, this has to do with the the 12, uh, we could say 12 strand um, Merkaba spin, if you will. So if we take the initial three strands and then we multiply it um, by four, right? Three, six, nine, 12. We have the 12 strands and those four groups of three make a cube or a square, which is one of the platonic solids as well. Um, which just so happens to be the triangle, the circle, the square, the same geometries one quote unquote manipulates or plays with for anti-gravity, for telekinesis, you name it. Um, if I may make a very respectful uh, uh, correction to what you said, doctor, the vast majority of public scientists, as I understand it, are not familiar with this and can't even grasp it because they have not been exposed to this new perspective of old physics. There are scientists in the know very strongly, but of course they, they can't speak publicly. Um, uh, forgive me, sorry, what, what was your, your question again? I just lost... Um, Oh, the, the 12 strand of DNA. Oh, yes, yes. I think I think there are in fact a total of 12 strands that represent um uh the Merkaba spin, as people would call it, uh having to do with what we call the ether, but specifically for those more into the science side, having to do with fermions um and half integer spins, having to do with um multi-dimensional realities that our DNA, sort of like branches of a tree, are extended out into. In, you, in this particular frequency, which is also the same one in type that is within that of the third strand of our, our junk DNA that has not been exposed publicly. Um, do I think we have a total of 12 strands? I would say absolutely. Um, I think it, I could be wrong, but I think it speaks to this fundamental three, sort of like um, in philosophy, Hegel's dialectic. You have the thesis, the antithesis, and then the synthesis, the collapsing of the wave down the center that sense of bliss and, and, and peacefulness to move on to that next stage of experience. Well, you mentioned the Merkaba, and I know that the, you know, for a lot of public scientists, I mean, they regard the Merkaba as kind of like a lot of mumbo jumbo. I mean, I know that there was uh, Drunvalo Melchizedek came out, I think it was in the 1980s with this two volume a set of books called The Flower of Life, and uh, people started to do the, the workshops associated with that, trying to generate their Merkaba using consciousness. And uh, certainly that seems to be something that people believe can be done through consciousness alone. But what you've described seems to be a very interesting mix of consciousness and kind of like reinterpreting old physics. So yeah, maybe just kind of like elaborate a little bit on, sure. on the Merkaba and how it relates to all of this. Sure, I appreciate that, Doctor. I think ultimately, to be clear as well, what I'm doing and what others around the world are doing, um, I think is nothing new per se. I think we are a species rediscovering the same set of uh, quote unquote tricks, if you will, over and over again, uh, which is why I say that what I'm working on is nothing to do with combining any type of AI or anything like this. It is purely organic with the planet in combination with alchemical processes um, and the human DNA and all of this. Now, that is not to say that it is the only way or it is the way, it is a way that I lean towards to in a much more organic, natural sense. When I say um, I apply nuts and bolts, I'm speaking, if I can use wood from the earth, I'd prefer that over any type of industrial, uh, you know, artificial development or material. Now, if I may, we see, for example, the, the Mayans, the, the, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, all of this, there seem to be, you know, the Tibetans, there seem to be different methodologies, whether it's using harmonics, some use liquids, some used electricity, and then the combination of all those things, really imagination is, is the limit in, in, a, in a beautiful sense. I think the same way that those different cultures and groups were tapping into various avenues of getting to the same underlying energy, 
of, of, of which consciousness, our consciousness seems to be much closer to than anything material here is what we're seeing today as well, except on a much more unfortunately hidden and smaller scale. I think you have certain, you know, countries or military divisions uh, applying a method one way. You have other divisions doing it another way. You have people like myself that are trying to apply a more benevolent um, initiative into this community um, in, in trying to take advantage of this emerging quantum industry where we can say, listen, this, there doesn't need to be X amount of chips put into the body whatsoever with, you know, magnets, certain elements of the planet and some other variables, we can, we can induce um, beautiful, not just experiences, but life changing ones that will in fact, um, hopefully, um, for lack of a better term, speed up the perspectives that people who are, dare I say, still asleep um, are having. Well, I know there'll be a lot of people in my audience that we will be very happy to hear that, that uh, a lot of these um, inventions or these applications that you've been describing, that that can be all achieved through organic consciousness, um, natural materials on the earth, maybe using magnets and so forth, that you don't have to go down this very complex path of AI and, you know, very complex metallurgy and building right. metallic ships and so forth, that this can all be done using a combination of just consciousness, alchemy, even astrology. I mean, which is, I, I find kind of fascinating that I know like a lot of people, astrology seems to be pretty clear in identifying personality traits. So it was a very big surprise to me to learn that the positioning of planetary bodies absolutely has an impact on the efficacy of you know, things like nuclear uh, processes or like being able to access portals and so forth. If I may, uh, doctor, if I could say to your point with all of this, um, absolutely. It, it's, um, I'm still learning as I go right now. Um, I still can, I will always consider myself a student of this type of energy and, and knowledge and all of this, because it's truly an unlimited, which speaks to the idea of, of pursuit and all that. But to give a direct example of the way that the planets would or could work in an energetic sense, if I may give two examples, say, for example, you're lying in bed, uh, this is to yourself and your audience uh, with your partner, and the, the closer you hug your partner, the more heat, the more hot you're going to feel by definition of being closer to another body. It's the exact same thing with the planets. The closer the attachment, if you will, or vicinity, the more of the propagation of the frequencies from that planetary body one is going to feel or experience. Now, I can't speak for any other planet. I can speak for what I think to be, you know, the Earth in certain regards. I don't know everything, um, but I think that it's the same idea. And with respect to things like astrology, astrotheology, um, there is a fantastic gentleman who, who I know by the name of uh, uh, Micah Dank, who does a beautiful job on that. But what I will say to those that are very frustrated when they hear, oh, it's the age of Aquarius. Well, okay, that means age of truth. But what does that mean specifically? Well, if you're lying, say, in New York City in an apartment and it's freezing cold and you're sleeping in your bed at night and you have uh, your window cracked open by accident, you forgot to close it, you feel the breeze come in. But are you going to feel the breeze if you have just one blanket on or if you have five layers of blankets on, for example? You're going to feel the breeze much more strongly if you only have one uh, blanket on instead of four or five. I would liken the blanket in this example to different frequency densities that the that the the procession of our planet goes through and so when people speak on the age of aquarius and there being more of a sense of awakening enlightenment truth and all of this in an organic sense not in an ai sort of singularity sense it speaks to this idea of literally the same way someone gets dirty and they sort of you know brush the dirt off of their shoulders so to speak would be the same way in a frequency sense that is being um that there's more of a, a metaphorical door that's been opened for people to go hold on a second i'm not just going to believe what's told to me i'm going to think for myself i know one of the things that you mentioned to me was that the scientists that you've been corresponding with that have been sharing ideas you've been giving them your equations and they've been very 
impressed by the equations, the mathematical equations or the renditions that you have for how a lot of these principles operate, that they say, well, you told me that they pay attention to a certain contactee, a French archaeologist. Do you want to say uh, a little bit about why these, these new science people are interested in her work? Yes. Um, well, th it's because there are a lot of uh, scientists behind the scenes of which, uh, to be clear, from various departments, not just one, uh, various departments, agencies, you name it, that have essentially reached out to me, um, in fairness and others as well, who have said essentially the, the, the message and the work that she is speaking on to a very large degree is quite accurate relative to what they're being briefed on and uh, what they understand to be the case behind the scenes. Now, unfortunately, um, I, as, we, as we discussed, I can't really go into details in a public regard, but it is certainly something that is taken very seriously and she is watched, listened to, and viewed very, very avidly. So um, there is, in fact, a very strong correlation with whatever um, this incredible lady has tapped into and with what, at least in the West, is being uh, analyzed and understood to be the case in terms of what's coming for, from the uh, UFO, UAP phenomena, in addition to what we could call a galactic federation of types. And of course, we're talking about Elena Denam, and that is someone that is actually looked at as a very credible person. And I know her books uh, that have uh, come out over the last couple of years have really been rich in details with different extraterrestrial civilizations and some of the technologies. And what you've experienced is that these scientists that are in touch with you that are trying to understand these equations and uh, the inventions and, and how they pertain to to their ongoing experiments actually read her books or watch her podcasts very very, very avidly very much so um in fairness i i don't mean to put myself on a pedestal i think that a lot of these guys understand my equations they're just interested to see if maybe i have a different take on them but other than that ab absolutely um there's a strong um observation uh i don't want to say surveillance i will say ob friendly observation from various elements departments and, and groups within such departments and elements that um keep a strong uh, i guess we could say eye and uh ear on people like Miss Miss Danon, and it's not because they have nothing else to do. Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay, well, that's that's very important. Um, so when we get to Salvador Payas, I mean, he is someone that created waves, quite a few waves about five years, four years ago. He came out with some applied for some patent inventions. I think there were five patents he applied for altogether, and it was covered by. Uh, the world media, and some of those patents dealt with things like a, well, I think the one that really kind of captured people's attention, I just wanted to share the image of that, and, and that is the hybrid, und, uh, the hybrid air underwater craft that uh, has been dubbed the HUAC, and so, yeah, you want to talk about that, I mean, how does what do you know of Salvador Payas and the feasibility of that kind of approach that he has? Sure. Well, first, let me say that I have nothing but tremendous and immense respect for Dr. Payas. I agree with him on literally almost everything he's discussed. I think he's made one appearance. He did one a verbal interview for, I think, The Drive, I believe, if I could be wrong there. But he also did an interview with a friend of mine, uh, Kurt Jaimungle, on theories of everything, in the sense that he says as well, this is a new perspective on old physics. He believes that um, philosophy with uh, being absent from physics and science is like a flower without water or a seed without water. Um, I really strongly agree with him in the spiritual intuitive sense. As for, and also I, I will say that I don't mean to sound um, overly conceited, but it is of my personal opinion and understanding that everything we've seen in these patents are in fact uh, not just feasible, but have been scaled and have been operational, operational for 
quite some time now. Now, with, with that said, the patent that you had just showed, Doctor, I appreciate you showing that because it's funny um, that uh, this was for the audience. This this part was none of this was planned, but I had actually developed my own uh, theoretical model of how to construct a very similar type craft in which I had presented to a couple different departments um, at the Pentagon, which is interesting. So uh, to tell you the truth, actually, I can... Uh, I have very immense and in-depth understanding of the construction of whether it's that particular craft or or others. I don't say that to boast or brag. I say that with respects to it may be more simplistic than people may think, but I certainly, um, with 100% certainty, uh, believe and am of the personal opinion and will go as far as to say have firsthand knowledge that those craft are in fact operational. They in fact are not just something that you, you know, take 10 feet into the sky and then that's it. Um, they can traverse uh, water, traverse uh, ver various types of um, basically almost anything we can think of in this reality as I understand it. And, and I would say they do very much work very strongly. Well, another one of the patent inventions uh, that Salvador Payas came up with was this uh, nuclear fusion uh, engine. And uh, this was something that was really amazing in terms of the uh, output of this device, that it was fully scalable and, and it, could, it could go up to um, a, giga, a gigawatt of, of energy. So what do you know of this nuclear fusion a reactor that Salvador Payes uh, applied for in terms of a patent application. Sure. As a matter of fact, Doctor, you're showing uh, patent images that are very similar to not just some of the things that I constructed and then had substantiated in, in laboratory. But basically, um, I, I want to say that I, I have nothing but immense respect for Dr. Paez, and I'm not trying to say anything in terms of anything negative whatsoever, but a lot of my own generator designs are very, are identical. One of them is identical to the, the image on, on the left here that we see. Um, and as a matter of fact, I'm, I would like to think I'm fairly well versed in nuclear fission and fusion. And I would say with utmost certainty that actually um, I had developed a much lower end version of one of these arrows or pine cones, if we would like to call it that, and then realized that if I had developed another three and made them all uh, quote unquote kiss at the at, at the final point of its uh, apex of its of its tip there, there would be some type of phenomena occurring. Um, so as a matter of fact, I do not claim to have developed anything nearly as sophisticated nor adva as advanced as, as Dr. Paez whatsoever. Um, but I can say that whether it's nuclear fission or fusion, whether it has to do with um, certain, uh, we could say, particle physics concepts that are no, uh, that do not exist in things like um, various forms of engineering and chemistry and optics, perhaps, perhaps um, deliberately, maybe, maybe not. But I, what I can say is that it, it, it does work. And um, you certainly get what's called COP over one, coefficient of performance over one, meaning you get more energy coming out of it than what you're putting in by far. Well, I thought it was very significant that uh, these five patent applications that Salvador Payes came out with were assigned to the U.S. Navy, to the Department of the Navy. And that, to me, was a, a clear sign that the Navy wanted these technologies to get out into the public arena. And that was also confirming that these technologies have been secretly used by the Navy in their secret space program for at least 30, maybe 40 years, going all the way back to the to the 1970s. So my question to you is, uh, do you think it's reasonable to say that the nuclear engines in these Nimitz class and these new Ford class aircraft carriers that the US Navy has, that rather than these being fission en engines, nuclear fission engines that some or all of these are in fact nuclear fusion engines 
it's very possible. I can't say personally because I have not been exposed to the data, nor have I, have I been on the ships themselves. But what I can say to that point, doctor, is that there is a very strong likelihood that in a lot of these craft, whether sea craft, undersea craft, um, land craft, or even aircraft, there are various, we could say, quote unquote, switches literal switches that the pilots can jump between, whether it's fission, fusion, or even dare I say anti-gravity, um, or what we would call anti-gravity. So do I think instead of fission, there are fusion uh, apparatuses? I would not rule it out whatsoever. I can't say I, I know this for certain, but it would certainly make sense with respects to this alleged, if we will, um, secret space program um, uh, I guess we could say set of affairs that has been occurring between what we know as the Navy and what we know as, you know, the Air Force. That's kind of the uh, elephant in the room. I actually had um, another one of the patents that uh, PayS came out with that I thought would be good to, to raise with you, which is, I think it's uh, from memory, the high frequency electromagnetic field generator, which pretty much created something like a Tesla shield and the, the energy required for this high-frequency electromagnetic field generator would be enormous. But this nuclear fusion reactor, uh, that would be this power supply, both for that and the earlier invention, the, the, the HUAC, the, um, the, the anti-gravity craft that could travel um, at, I think it was 400 knots under the water. And so... This idea of a Tesla shield, I think it's very important today, especially for the future, that the kind of missile defense systems that are in operation to defend cities. I mean, we're seeing this in, in Ukraine at the moment. I mean, they're, they're trying to shoot these incoming Russian missiles with kind of like the Patriot missiles or well, they're sending them Patriot missiles, but they're trying to shoot them down with any missile defenses. What about these kind of like... Um, Tesla shields that could be generated by these nuclear fusion reactors being placed in every city. Wouldn't that be revolutionary? Absolutely. I, I can say with certainty that whether it's plasmas or plasmoids, whatever we like, we would like to call it, or interacting with, you know, things like gases or Bose-Einstein condensates or what we could interpret as various forms of chemicals and mixture with that in mixture with some type of underlying um, core electromagnetic source. It is very feasible. I would say that one needs to simply, um, one only needs to look at the, even the United States Patent Office, and we will see that there have been allegedly a lot of these quote unquote generators, these arc generators, if you will, whether patented by Boeing or other, um, I believe by Boeing, yes, um, to protect their tanks, to protect vast amounts of certain areas, and it could very easily be applied to cities. I mean, this is why, uh, for the benefit of protecting people and things like this, this is why I think ultimately that, again, um, as much as a lot of this stuff is what's called in military intelligence dual use, it could be used for both good and bad, um, it ultimately is simply a tool that it ultimately depends on who the user of the tool is intending to use it uh, to with, towards, you name it. Um, and if I may say as well, doctor, uh, one last thing with respect to the high frequency um, uh, electromagnetic generator, if I'm not mistaken, if I may say, and I don't mean this uh, disrespectfully towards you at all, sir, but when you had said that it seems that it would take large amounts of energy to do so, um, I would very respectfully disagree in the sense that you're not wrong if we are following the current model of physics, what's called uh, U1 uh, closed system models. But um, if we were to follow a model, a set of models that is now under what's you know called quantum physics or quantum field theory that others too as well back in the day, like Russell Targ and uh, Hal Pudoff and all of them have even done public papers on, we'll find that that missing key that we've been discussing this whole time changes the whole game for that, where in fact, maybe energy that resides within a Duracell battery could power and create that effect. So it's, it's, it gets interesting. This goes back to the whole, it's nothing new. It doesn't break any laws of physics. It's just a new perspective on old physics. Very, very interesting. Well, I, I'd like to now turn over to this, um, initiative that you've come up with, this um, SALT initiative. And I know you talk about longitudinal waves, which are also considered to be, some people talk about them as, as scalar waves. So how does this kind of longitudinal wave 
uh, become relevant to this kind of like new physics or this old physics reinterpreted today? Sure, sure. You're speaking, I guess, because it's in the, the name of the company, I take it. Yes. Right. Um, so these waves seem to inhabit some type of very, uh, we could say, uh, peculiar set of, of what would be called matrices, um, a combination of both real frequencies and what would be called complex frequencies or complex conjugates or potentials. And to, to, to simplify it, basically something that is there in quote unquote empty space or in the ether, but we cannot observe or touch it at that particular moment. There's something unique about that particular, those particular waves and frequencies that may in, help explain some more of the underlying phenomena that we're seeing. Um, which is why I've uh, put put it in the name of the company. Um, I discuss it on my my Substack, on my Patreon, because I think there seems to be some type of um, activation key. It is not the key, but there seems to be some type of element that brings us one step closer to tapping this zero point energy by looking at these particular uh, frequencies, these particular densities, um, all of that stemming from these. I guess you could say very, very interesting frequencies. They're not anything that has, they've been there in terms of the thermal artifact and otherwise, but they simply um, have only been used. I, I mean, we have, for example, LIGO to detect these, these uh, gravitational waves and things like this, but there doesn't seem to be much coming from that, at least publicly. Um, I'm trying to take a different approach with this particular frequency and see maybe could something be done, not just theoretically, it's one thing to calculate and have a, an equation be satisfied as they called it and complete, but it's another thing to do it in the lab. And, and there may be a, a spiritual aspect to, to these, um, these particular frequencies as well. If there, if we had a soul, a chi or a prana, if you will, um, it's possible in my humble opinion, they may in fact reside uh, along these frequencies. Now I could be very wrong, but I think that there's a there there at the very least. Well, I'd love to uh, continue this conversation, but maybe we should uh, come back and, and talk about some of these other issues that come up from your work. But I think it is very fascinating. So I want to direct people to uh, Dave's podcast, uh, the Generation Z podcast. So uh, where do people go if they want to follow up on your work and, and what you're doing and, and support you, importantly? Sure, I appreciate that so much. So first and foremost, I want to thank you, Doctor, for a fantastic conversation. And I do want to say as well to those that are um, that are interested and for those that have been listening this whole time, I'm not asking anyone to believe me whatsoever. I'm simply asking you folks to simply be open to what's being discussed because maybe those listening or watching may have a view that, I've, that I've, they've interpreted differently than myself and we can discuss those type of things on um specifically on patreon.com slash generation z we have multiple tiers we do members only episodes multiple times per week we get um a group zoom calls people can access episodes long before i do them people also get to see behind the scenes um insights into some of the things that i can photograph of which uh i'm building in in, in certain laboratories in addition to what i'm working on uh theoretically as well there's a lot more on the patreon simply because it's my way of saying thank you to those that are so gracious to allow me to do this so patreon.com slash generation z um if anyone types in generation z z e d podcast on youtube apple podcast podbean and spotify you can find me there as well i'm also on twitter at podcast z z e d no spaces no capitals and um we will have a a website launching soon as well but that's about it for now and i'd, I'd like to thank you so much doctor well, well, thank you, Dave. I'm looking forward to having you back on the show and uh, taking up this fascinating conversation and inquiry into the, the new physics, new sciences. Thank you, sir. You have been listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.